Hey guys, I'm Nathan from Arms and Armor. Uh, the other day, our friend Matt Jensen did a video uh, about our glaive, and he had some questions about it, and then some more questions were raised uh, in the comments uh, below his video, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to address some of them and uh, think through, in particular, what these rondels were for on pole arms. Stay tuned. So Matt had some questions about the rondel on uh, our glaive and how it worked and why it was constructed uh, the way it was, right? So this rondel, you'll see it, it's relatively lightweight uh, and it is held on by four uh, forged feet uh, that are held on with nails onto the shaft and we chose this method of doing it based on a piece that's in the Wallace collection. It's number uh, A926. Uh, it's a pole axe uh, that has a rondel on it that's just like this. Uh, we compared that to illustrations of glaives from the 14th century uh, that seem to show something really similar. It looks like there were two major ways of connecting a rondel to the shaft. And the first way was with these little feet. Now, depending on which uh, piece you're looking at, sometimes instead of being below the guard, they came up above it. And other times the guard itself had a little sleeve that came up from the rondel here onto the shaft that then would be tacked in uh, with nails. Either way, this wasn't a guard that was meant to stop, you know, these giant blows from coming down and hitting your hand. Right? It's not, doesn't appear to be for parrying heavy weapons. Right? Instead, what they're for, I think, and my opinion is informed by <laughs> having read a lot and looked at a lot of these things, uh, and also, no one knows for certain. Uh, it's an archaeological question. Uh, but <laughs> I think what they're for is when you're wearing a gauntlet, you're wearing full armor, as I had mentioned in Matt's video, when you're wearing a gauntlet, the part of your hand that isn't armored is the inside of your hand. And if you're going to grip something, there's a gap around the palm of your hand where you can be stabbed. Now, it's probably less than half an inch on most medieval gauntlets, but none of them ground out, right? The way that, you know, kind of modern bowhurt gauntlets do that close off the entire thing because they want to have dexterity, right? So if you're fighting in armor, what this rondel does is it prevents your forward target, your hand, right here, from being attacked by your opponent in a way that would hit you in the palm of your hand. Right? So it is a piece of armor rather than being, for example, a big parrying lug like we see on a lot of big fighting spears, what people often call boar spears, right, with these uh, big lugs that uh, come off in the same direction as the plane of the blade. Some of those are boar spears, some of those are fighting spears where you can catch your opponent's blow and push it out of the way. And those are pretty beefy uh, for that. These were clearly not for that. And the evidence is in all of the depictions and existing ones. They're lightweight and they're not built to stop a giant pull hammer blow, right? They're a little shield that protects your hand. The more weight you put out here, right? If you want a big, you know, eighth inch thick shield with a lot more metal out there, you're putting more and more weight uh, that's slowing down your weapon. And I think it's something they didn't want to do. So I've got some pictures of the one from the Wallace and of the Glaives uh, on this blog post that you can look at 
uh, up close. Of course, if you want it more heavy duty, we're happy to do that, right? We hand build every single one of them. So if you have a request like that, we can do it. Uh, another question that he raised was about the butt spike uh, on these and some of the design choices we made. So this is in, he had mentioned that he liked it when they were in set. Uh, it actually is. Uh, the steel uh, is just thick. And so it stands out from the wood a little bit. If you want it flush with the wood, we can do that. That's no big deal. But he had mentioned also that he would like uh, possibly more decoration down here. Now, this is interesting because this piece is from the 14th century. And the 14th century aesthetic for weapons was pretty austere. Right? So if we look at 14th century swords and 14th century pole arms, there's not a lot uh, of decoration that's added to them. Instead, right, if we went earlier to the Viking Age, you have highly decorative pieces. And if you look later into, say, the 16th and 17th century, pole arms have all kinds of etching and engraving uh, on them. But in the 14th century, it's not the case. Right? So when we designed this one, we tried to build it with a 14th century aesthetic and adding this little decorative medallion here on the pin that uh, helps to hold the head on was something that's actually fairly uncommon in this period uh, to do, but we thought it really blinked it up. It was historically plausible. Uh, but a lot more decoration than that on something like this would be anachronistic from the 14th century. So the thing that you should note on this weapon is the thickness uh, of the blade here, right? This is the thing that really sets it apart uh, from any other uh, contemporary replicas you're going to find, uh, is that it is of historical uh, thickness and it is uh, hardened carbon steel. Now, most of the originals from the period were probably actually iron uh, and probably weren't hard at all. <laughs> um, but we think there's a decent chance that some of the higher prestige ones uh, were steel and were hardened. So that's how we made this one uh, in particular. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, one other thing. So this is the prototype uh, that Matt had. And he found that when he was uh, cutting that there developed just a touch of a wobble in here. Uh, so we're making a change to address that. Uh, on this piece in our original design, the langets are separate pieces from the head and they go up underneath the head alongside the shaft. Uh, and that is absolutely a historically accurate way of doing it. But in order to provide a little more reinforcement here, we're gonna make the langets integral with the socket, which means that there will be a welded connection between the langets and the socket, uh, which will provide a little more lateral uh, support uh, on this thing. So that's one of the reasons we send new products out uh, to people to test so we can troubleshoot issues that might arise like that. So, Hopefully, uh, this answered some questions about why uh, we made the choices we did uh, on this piece. And I think it's illustrative of the way that we try and design stuff generally, right? We try to use the kinds of decorative and functional details that were appropriate to that piece at that time, right? Uh, so, if we were going to make a partisan from, or a, a glaive from 1550 instead of 1350, right, it might have a whole lot more bling on it. But by that point, they were kind of, they used them, but they were ceremonial, right? So those really fancy pole arms with all the etching and stuff on them, the ones that are in a bunch of museums, 
those were like that and they've survived because they were the weapons of the bodyguards of the Prince Elector of Saxony <laughs> or something like that, right? So they were meant to show off how fancy the Prince Elector was uh, and that's kind of why they got saved. These earlier ones, 14th century, they were high status weapons, but the aesthetic at the time was much more uh, stark. It was based on the beauty of form instead of of decoration, right? So like the lines and curves on the blade would have been one of the things they were interested in rather than decoration uh, all over the surface. All right, thanks very much, take care.